today is our last study in the book of Hebrews. So some of you will be saying, praise God, in more ways than one. Uh, I would say, praise God that we've gone this far into the book and we're going to finish it. And I'm already missing it. And I will give you my same spiel I do every time. It's my favorite book of the New Testament. And it's my favorite book in the New Testament because that's what we're studying. The next book we study will be my favorite book in the New Testament as well. So keep us in prayer. Uh, for the next part of the month, we'll be doing a, a series on the purpose of his coming or why Jesus came. And I want you to come to those. We have success, consecutive uh, uh, studies coming up on Sundays. And next Sunday, our good friend Save is going to do one of those messages that I had prepared. Yes, I'm excited too. And he's going to do it on 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Look it up later. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Why Jesus came. And so, uh, Sav is great. Don't miss it. And then the next part of the month, we'll continue on with the other parts of why Jesus came. And I think it's important for Christians to know this time of year why Jesus came. And uh, there's a lot more to the New Testament in terms of the gospel uh, that is related to the coming of Christ. Jesus came. Uh, for that purpose, and you'll, you'll find out more about it. There's several passages of Scripture that tells you why Jesus came, specifically why he came. And uh, it wasn't just to make us uh, happy on Christmas Day. It was much more than that. He is making us happy every day, but it's much more than just a date on the calendar. So with that, Hebrews chapter 13, let's pray together, and we'll do 9 through 25 today. Finish the book. Dear Lord, we come to you with thankful hearts, with willing hearts to listen what you have to say to us today. Lord, we may have come with a heavy heart, maybe a broken heart, maybe an elated heart, but Lord, we want to give our hearts to you, that you would mold it and shape it according to your purpose for us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that teaches us. Thank you that we have each other so we can have fellowship and communion. Thank you that through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Father. And so, Lord, all these prayers are being made. All these songs are being sang, and they're getting right up to heaven. They're getting right up to the throne, and you are delighted that your people praise you and thank you and pray. And so, Lord, now please bless us, Lord, with your word and the understanding that we need in order to live in Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 13, and you have known this already. Hebrews, it's all about Jesus. There's only one other New Testament book that has the name of Jesus more, more than Hebrews, and that's Philippians. Philippians has more mentions of Jesus directly than Hebrews, but Hebrews is really all about Christ, and it's specifically the ministry of Christ and what, who he is to us in terms of our great high priest, our great high priest. It's a very key, essential part of Hebrews. If you get that, you understand how you live your life. You live your Christian life by God's word. And you live your Christian life by going to your high priest every day. So these two things are highlighted throughout the book. Get into God's word, come to your great high priest, okay? That's been chapters one through, I guess, through 10 all throughout the book. The last part of the book has to do with this, running, running the race. As a Christian, you have to run the race, not just a walk, because we do walk with Christ, but we also run with endurance, our Christian faith. And that has to do with looking unto Jesus. He's the author, and he's the finisher of our faith. And so when we look to Jesus, we look to Jesus in certain ways. How do we run with Jesus, or how do we run toward Jesus, right? What areas of our lives do we pay attention to? Because it's one thing to say, if I tell you, look to Jesus, what does that mean, right? I can say it. It's an open-ended statement, and it could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Thank God the book of Hebrews tells you how you look to Jesus, sort of the boundaries of your line, and especially if you're you know, if, you're, if you've been into sports or play sports, you know that there has to be some boundaries, some lines in which you play in. Well, it's same for the Christian life. There's some lines that have been drawn out by the writer of Hebrews to tell us, how do we run toward Jesus? How do we look to him and keep running? One of the ways is you watch your relationship with other Christians. We talked about that 
seems like a month ago or two months ago. It's all convoluted now, by the way. I don't even know. I left for Israel, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, at some point, I came back, and, and it's been and it's been ups and downs. Um, how are you doing with that one? We talked about it about a couple of months ago, maybe. Your relationship with other Christians. Is it, is it something you're striving for to better? Is it striving for uh, better consideration of other Christians, to love other Christians? Let brotherly love continue, says the writer of Hebrews. That's an important part. How you look to Jesus and you say, well, I'm running and looking to Jesus. Then we should say or we should see how your relationship with other Christians is developing. Is it, is it getting better or getting worse? Hospitality is part of that. And the writer of Hebrews talks about being hospitable and even to, uh, in your hospitality uh, to strangers, even to strangers, right? Because we, we like to bring people into our homes that we like. Is that the case? We like to bring people into our homes that we like or people that would reciprocate the, the invite. Those who invite us back, we like to invite ourselves. But what about those who couldn't invite you? What about those who have no means to invite you back or no means to host you? Would you still invite them? That's the purpose of Hebrews. In and in so doing, he says, you would, might entertain angels unaware. So quite of an amazing thing if you think about it. The other thing is, how do we look to Jesus or how we run toward Jesus is not to be infected by the world's attitude toward two things, marriage and money, which are the big M's, right? Marriage and money. How you look at marriage, how you look at your marriage, how you look at marriage in general uh, shows a lot of how you view Christ, how you run toward Christ. And um, there's no reason believers should get divorced. There, there, there shouldn't be a reason for believers to get divorced. If it has come to that, then you need some kind of intervention by other believers or counseling or pastoral. But divorce should be the last resort of last resort. Uh, but we see in our world that the Christian marriages don't last as, they don't last as much as the, the, the marriages outside of Christ, right? The, the, the marriages in the world, um, 50%, I think it's a little more now, so I used to say 50%, that's just um, default. It's almost 60% now. Uh, Christian marriages, anybody have a, uh, a guess? How many Christian marriages end in divorce? Yeah, almost 60%. You would have been right. Almost 60%. So it's a trend. The world goes like this, and Christian marriages go like that. So uh, who's copying who? Right? There used to be a time where Christian marriages would, was the example, that you would look toward a Christian couple and say, I want to be just like that couple. And, you, and many people came to faith because they had Christian couples, Christian uh, husbands and wives around them that influenced them for Christ. Nowadays, it seems to be on the, um, the other way. Um, Christian couples are looking to the world and seeing what they have, and, and it's ending up the way it's ending up. And the other thing is money, greed, the attitude of money toward money. And um, we can whole, say a whole lot about that. Uh, but another one is right relationship with spiritual leaders. We talked a whole lot about that in that last, last subject uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's right relationship with leaders in the church, godly relationships with leaders in the church. And uh, I would have to say about that that there's two extremes. I didn't think I said that last time, but sometimes right relationship with leaders, it's absolutely, well, it is important. But sometimes wrong relationship with leaders lead to either rebellion by the congregation toward the leaders or the leaders become too heavy-handed and it becomes a, um, what would you call it? Not legalism, but uh, heavy shepherding, heavy shepherding, where leaders now actually manhandle the sheep because, hey, you have to submit, right, to godly leadership. So godly leadership becomes a very important part of the Christian life. And hopefully you do have right relationships with Christian leaders, um, not only in this church, but maybe other churches as well. So that's the key part, at least for now. That's what he's told us. These are the boundaries that we should run in. You're running toward Jesus. You're walking with Christ, running toward Christ. Then keep those things in mind, four things. Now he's going to get into a little bit more. And verses 9 through 16, so two points today, very simple. Christianity is not external. He's going to get into the, some of the temptations that these Christians uh, around Jerusalem, which this letter was written to, were having, these temptations. What was the temptation is to go back to external religion, go back to external religion. And the second thing is um, he's going to talk about an exhortation and two, I should have said benedictions, but two benedictions. It's the benediction, but it's actually two of them that he actually ends with. And a benediction is sort of like 
the grand worship and praise of God that he reminds us to have at the end. So we'll have that, and it ends in a, it's one of the most amazing benedictions in the New Testament. It's one of the best ones. I love, I love the one in Jude, uh, but hopefully this one in Hebrews, um, it's really, really powerful how he ends um, giving glory to Christ, which that's what the benediction is. So let's talk about the first one. In verse 9, chapter 13, verse 9. Do not be carried away by a variety of strange teachings. For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were so occupied were not benefited from. So what does it mean by this? So the first point, our first point is um, Christianity is not external. It's a, it's a deep spiritual internal relationship that begins in the heart. It begins in the inward parts, right? God changes us from the inside out. Remember, in creation, he first created the world, then he created men, right? In the new creation, he recreates men, and then he will recreate the world in the millennium and eternity. There will be a new environment. A new creation will come. But in the New Testament, the new creation begins inwardly. Right? The old creation began outwardly. He created the worlds. In the New Testament, the new creation begins inwardly. Right? The inner man being born again is the key part to it all. Christianity begins in the internal parts of a person's being. Call it the heart. Call it the will. Call it the innermost parts of a man. That is true that it begins there. It does not begin external. If your relationship with God is all about the external things, we're doing it wrong. In fact, you might not even be a Christian if that's the case. And I'm not saying that necessarily only. The book of Hebrews tells us that. The devil has always played this game, strained teachings into the church. Always play this game. Now, it's not a game that we should play. He plays a game. We shouldn't. It happened in the Old Testament with Israel. He introduced several strange teachings that led Israel further and further away from God into idolatry. In fact, at one point, it was so... Incredible to see, if you read it in the prophets, they actually were calling their gods, their idols, Yahweh. They actually were calling their gods and idols by the name of Yahweh, by the name of God, thinking that they were actually worshiping the God of heaven and earth that created heaven and earth and, 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 and basically created Israel as the idols. They were, they were calling them by their own name, by, by the same name, thinking that they were worshiping the same God. That's how strange the ideas become. In fact, that they were doing all the sacrifices and then going out and committing idolatry and immorality in the name of God. That's what God said to them, to Israel. Don't even say my name anymore. It says in Jeremiah, don't even say my name. Don't say my name anymore. I'm tired of you saying my name because they were invoking other deities using Yahweh. Can you imagine that? Well, don't think of it any strange today. There's lots of cults and people that believe in new age ideas that would say Jesus. And because it's so tragic to see Christians going, well, they said Jesus, but which one did they mean? Is it the, the, the Mormon Jesus? Is it the Jehovah's Witness Jesus, right? These are not the same Christ. It's not the same Jesus of the scripture. Therefore, we have to ask the question, just like Israel fell into those strange doctrines, strange teachings, the church has also fallen into that. It's tragic to see believers, and this has happened, um, that has happened in this church, it's happened to other churches, it's happened to many churches, it's happened to friends of mine, tragically, to see a believer start out right and then become infatuated with some strange idea, either by books, and I wonder, how did they get this strange idea? YouTube is you know, festered with that. It's like replete. It's pregnant with that. Don't get your theology from, from, from YouTube. Now, get your theology from the Bible. Now, in, having said that, we are on YouTube. Um, if it agrees with the Bible, then yes. If it agrees with the Bible, then yes. But don't just base it off someone's just behind a camera and saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, and go along with it without really first checking what the Scripture says. Now, some strange ideas, and people get stuck in it. Holidays, foods. Uh, feast, it's a big thing, even now. Um, compare all these things with Jesus. See what he said and see if it fits, right? Now, ladies, just, just a blanket statement for ladies. not saying particular one, but saying this happens to a lot of ladies also. Because ladies have a higher uh, spiritual 
depth. There we go. Higher spiritual depth. Uh, they could easily be manipulated into some spiritual thing. Thinking is biblical. How many Jehovah's Witnesses have I talked to? And they said, uh, yeah, we went to talk to this, uh, this family, and uh, no one was home, so we talked to the, the mom, the wife. And she got the family into the watchtower, right? It happens more than you think. It's not a coincidence. They do target. Why? Women have a higher spiritual depth. They, they love spiritual things. In fact, uh, sometimes, a lot of times, it's the wife that comes first to Christ before the husband does. Why? She just has a higher spiritual depth. That's the way God made them. God created them with that spiritual depth. They're more sensitive to the Lord and to his spirit in a good way. They could also be susceptible to another spirituality. Now, men, you know, as my wife says, sometimes we're insensitive. Well, at least I am insensitive. So, therefore, it's harder for me to become very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I have to really pray and really, man, don't we have that, that problem? Is it just me? Okay, pray for Just me. Okay. Please pray. Please pray. I have to really bear down. I have to like, okay, just everybody just quiet, you know. I need to pray. And what's wrong with you? Nothing. I just, I just don't know how to hear from the Lord at this, right? Why? Just the way God made us with a less sensitive uh, spirituality. But once a man is born again, in a lot of cases, he's born again. It takes a while. But once he's born again, he's born again. Because it's not, it's not just about the spiritual and the emotion. It's really about truth and doctrine and facts, which a lot of times leads us to a higher spirituality, right? So, ladies, be careful with that. And this has happened to many ladies. We had a lady here one time, you know, that um, she dragged her whole family into a cult because she started listening to some YouTube video and stuff like that, which I told her not to do. I warned her husband about it. I talked to them. I went to their home. I pleaded with them hours and hours in their home, and they just went with it, and they dragged not so many people from the church, but other, from other churches as well. Um, they dragged their family into it. It had nothing to do with Scripture. It had nothing to do with the Bible. It was just a hyper-spirituality that they had with no basis of Scripture and, and legalism fell into that. So, but it's even popularized today in mainstream media personalities. Notice how many media personalities have come to faith in the last 20, 30 years, right? Um, most of them don't last. Hopefully, it's some, I mean, I do pray for them, and some of them do. Some of them don't. But the conclusion is that even media personalities can influence a form of Christianity that becomes very, it's not biblical. You know, people have talked about the Kanye West story all the time with the Ye, whatever his name is, right? And he brings a, a Christ ideas, but it's, it's completely mired in, not in Scripture, mired in anti-Semitism, mired in unbiblical doctrines, mired in, in uh, even meeting with... Uh, uh, um, um, what's that one? Louis Farrakhan. I guess you can't say that, but maybe they won't take us out of YouTube, right? Uh, but that it's it's completely based in racist ideas, uh, thinking that he's doing God's will, and he says, "I'm doing God's. I'm God's warrior," and this and that. Far from it. Or other people. It's not just him, but you know, many people that have come through. Um, uh, I think I don't even know some of these artists. Help me out. Uh, some guy Beaver. Beaver. Okay, yeah, he got into Hillsong, I think it was. Oh, what a mess. Poor guy. Poor kid. I mean, I really did feel for him because it was wrong. I mean, what that pastor was doing with him was absolutely unbiblical and wrong, and look where he ends up, right? Uh, but this is the form of Christianity we see in the world. And so kids grab onto it and says, I want to be like him. I want to be like her. I want to have this type of Christianity. In the third century... The Gnostics had nearly destroyed all of Christianity. By the 3rd century, so this is about 300 years after Jesus, the Gnostics, which you read about in 1 John and some parts of Timothy, Paul and John are warning about, had literally destroyed all of Christianity. In fact, most of mainstream Christianity in the 3rd century had an aberration theology, meaning that they did not believe the gospel as is presented in Scripture. They had false ideas about Jesus, they have false ideas about Christ, who he was. He was a man, not God. He was God and not men. He pretended to be God. He was a ghost. You couldn't hug him. You, he, he didn't come in the flesh. Uh, there was another God named Elohim, and there was another God named Yahweh, and Jesus came to represent Elohim, and Yahweh is an evil God. All these things, and I'm not kidding. 
on and on and on. If you really want to know all this stuff, there, this man, Irenaeus, who was uh, discipled by Polycarp, who was discipled by John the Apostle, who was discipled by Jesus, of course, he's the last of the church fathers who had a direct connection to Christ through the people that he knew. He wrote a book called Against Heresies, Against Heresies. And if you read it and if you happen to stomach through it, because there's a lot of stuff that you go, oh, man, how did they believe this stuff? You will find out that the church was full of false teachings in the third century, full of it. In fact, I didn't even know how it survived. In fact, if you read church history, if you're interested in that, um, which I highly encourage you to know somewhat about church history, every Christian should know somewhat about church history, because if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. And that's not true, and that's not only true in secular history, but also in biblical history. If you don't know it, you're going to repeat the same things. Most people did not believe the gospel. There was only a few remnant believers who held to it, including Irenaeus. But thank God for him and other men like Athanasius and, things, and people like that that were able to bring back the gospel back to the churches and people began to be saved, truly became saved again, uh, despite the false teachings that were permeating the church. How did the church survive? It was a miracle. It was a miracle which God is a God of miracles, he's going to keep his church. Because he said, even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it's true. Even when you see it completely devastated, the Lord always preserves those who love his word and love his truth. And therefore, they weren't able to destroy the church in the third century. Now, um, Gnosticism and all that continues, but now we know at least there's a separation. This is good. This is sound biblical doctrine. This is Gnosticism made up stuff, right? So anyway, don't want to get you too far into that. But here's one important thing. And commentators get really particularly uh, disturbed by this because it says here, don't be carried away by strange doctrines for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who are so occupied were not benefited. Now, food. How does this have to do with strange doctrines? Commentators really struggle with this. So hopefully we can make something out of this, right? Religion has always had this strange connection with food. I don't know if you noticed that. Spirituality and food always go together. Uh, whether it's New Ageism, whether it's Hinduism, you know, putting the food before the idols. You've seen that? No? Okay. Or New Ageism, right, that brings about some kind of diet. I'll prove it to you real quick. This, this idea of man-made climate change, right? What are they having people to do now? You have to change. Yeah. <laughs> You have to change your food. You have to change your diet. You have to eat some bugs. You have to eat some plant-based. Not kidding. Right. Uh, and it has to do with this spirituality that's in, invading our world. We call it the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. What's the spirit of the age? Climate change bad. People are bad. Humans are bad. We need to, you know, depopulate, bring back the worship of nature. You can't take from nature. You can't eat beef. You can't eat this. You can't eat the other. And we're going to give you what to eat, bugs and plants. And, uh, and if you eat the other stuff, you're some, some, some sort of subhuman. Now, it may be political. It may have a face of, like, business and economics. But you know what's at the heart of it? A spirituality. How do you know this? Well, the same movement went up to the traditional site of Mount Sinai, which is in Egypt. Uh, Jabal Musa, the Mount of Moses, they call it. And that the climate change group went up there with their own Ten Commandments. And they even had a Jewish guy break one of the tablets and promote that the God was given a new Ten Commandments, which had to do with their own spirituality about clean the earth, you know, depopulate, blah, 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 blah. And it was, it was well, why did they have, I mean, couldn't they have gone to Paris, New York? I mean, there's plenty of weird people up in Hollywood. But, sorry. Some, you know, people that believe this stuff, right? Uh, no, they had to go to... Mount Sinai. Now, long story short, I don't believe that's the exact place where it was, but that's another story. But they believe that's where God gave the Ten Commandments, and they were acting like the new Moses was here. Now, what would they have to do that if it's just, if it's science, if it's sociological, if it's economical, if, it's, if it has to do with cleaning out the earth, why do you have to invoke some kind of spirituality? Because they have to. Because it is rooted in spirituality, and it has to do with food. Anyway, long story short, it gets into Christianity. Do you know there's movements among Christians that say you should be vegan, and you should be vegetarian, and on and on and on, and you have to keep a certain diet to be more spiritual? No kidding. Now, 
the Jews had a special diet. There's no doubt about it. In the Old Testament, God gave a kosher diet. The dietary laws were part of the Old Covenant. Absolutely. But this is puzzle commentators. What does the writer of Hebrews have anything to do with this? It seems to be, from the text, that the Jewish people that were receiving this letter, called Hebrews, right? They lived in Jerusalem. They were being tempted to go back under the Old Covenant and go back under the sacrificial system. And some of those sacrificial systems, if you remember correctly, had to be eaten by the worshiper. If you go back to Leviticus, now this is, go back to Leviticus. I don't think we've ever done Leviticus here, but if you read it, don't be afraid of it. It's an amazing book. Read it along with Hebrews. It makes sense. In Leviticus, some animals were killed, and the worshiper would partake of the food along with the priest. Some animals, you were not allowed to eat it. In particular, the sin offering, you were not allowed to eat it. That was only for God, which makes sense, right? If you think about Christ fulfilling all the animal sacrifices, the sin offering was not to be consumed by anybody. It was only offered to God. There was only one thing that the sin offering produced that was important for the worshiper. Anybody know what that was? Blood. Blood. Blood had to be the most important part of that sacrifice. Not what you ate, but what the animal shed in order to be sprinkled among the people and cleanse the sanctuary and all those things, right? So it was a teaching mechanism by God, if you think about it in the Old Testament, that these animals, foreshadowing Christ, eventually will become the perfect sacrifice. There were some that you could partake, but the sin offerings you could not partake because it wasn't by flesh, it wasn't by eating, it was by blood that you would be atoned for. It was God already instilling in them that one time, that one day, the Messiah would come and his blood would be the only thing you would need in order to be saved, right? And so they were being tempted to go back. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, these Jews, these believing Jews at this time, were being forced to go back under the sacrificial system, not forced by anybody else, but by their own temptations, and believe that if you partake of some of these animal blood or uh, animal flesh, which was sacrificed in the temple. It was, the temple was still standing. They would have some kind of special merit or some special grace if they would partake of the animal, right? Just like in the old covenant. But now that the new covenant has come, the book of Hebrews makes it clear, there's no need for those animal sacrifices anymore. So the temptation is to go back under the old covenant law, partake of the animal flesh, and think that you have some kind of special grace by receiving it. And this was a big temptation. Now, you may not be tempted to do that because you have no relationship, connection to an Old Testament. I don't think anybody here has done an Old Testament sacrifice, right? But Paul says, don't be carried away by every wind of doctrine. He's told us that in Ephesians. Here, the writer of Hebrews says, don't get into strange doctrines. That has to do with food in particular. And the food here has to do with the fact that what, what you eat is supposed to sanctify you. That's, that was the idea. That if you have some kind of special food, you would be, have some special grace within you, right? And you can't get that by, you can't get grace by special food. You can't get grace by some external thing that you do. That's the point, right? And, and here, the writer of Hebrews is saying, you won't, if you think you're going to make progress by eating special things, to receive the grace of God, you're not. In fact, it even says, some who were occupied, verse, end of verse 9, were not benefited from it. Meaning that there, are, there were people that did it. The priests took on the sacrifice. They, they ate some of the sacrifice, but they didn't benefit from it. What you need is spiritual strength. What you need is something within you. What you need is grace. The kindness of God that comes through Jesus Christ. That's what you need. To really strengthen you and to really grow, you don't need some external food. You know, you don't need an Old Testament sacrifice and eat it. And again, there's Christian legalism that gets into play here because there are some believers that believe that you have to have a special diet, like vegetarianism. Or there are some Christians who believe that you have to eat kosher to have some kind of merit or some kind of special grace. That is totally wrong. Totally wrong. Now, if you want to eat kosher... And if you want to eat that, absolutely. The Bible says don't judge what people eat or what people don't eat. In fact, if the weaker brother says, Paul wants to eat salads, let him eat salad. Absolutely, right? 
Kind of interesting that says that about the weaker brother, eat salad. No, no, I'm not making any sense into it. It just says that. And if the stronger brother wants to eat meat, let him eat meat. But don't let the stronger brother stumble the, young, the, the weaker brother, but don't let the weaker brother enforce his views on the stronger brother. Because at the end, is love. And if you want to eat a salad, eat a salad. And I'll eat one with you. Yeah? But if you want to eat a, rib, uh, eat a, 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 rib, a ribeye, no problem there. Eat it. Just call me before you do so we can have enjoy, enjoy it together, right? Because it's not what comes into a man, Jesus said, that defiles him. It's what comes out of a man that defiles him, right? So the spirituality has nothing to do with external things. Now, um, there are religions that, 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 that teach that, that you have some kind of merit, that you merit something by doing external things. Now, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and I love Catholic people. But I have to tell them this. When I was a Catholic, they used to tell me that if I did certain things, I would earn a special grace from God. So guess what? My mom took me when I was very, a baby, and they took me to, against my wishes, right? and they baptized me, thinking, and this is Catholic doctrine, that if you do that, the baby have a special grace. It's called the removal of the original sin by being baptized. No, I had no say in the matter, and nobody knew my heart at that time, right? But despite the child's heart and condition of his inside, they baptize the child. That's what they do. And in order for you to keep in right relationship with God, you have to do penance, you have to attend mass, all external, in order to receive grace. That's, that's, that's true. And I, I, I lived it. I, I, I used to believe it um, as far as I understood it. But that was part of a system that makes you think that if you're part of a structure, you're going to get grace, now, take that in. We can criticize that and say, oh, how terrible. But what about when in Christians that you believe there, is a, there are Christians who believe that there's special nourishment in the Lord's table? When you take communion, there's special nourishment. Hope nobody believes that here. And if you do, please see me after, you know, and we'll talk about it. Uh, there are believers that think that there is some special merit by taking the communion, that by taking the, 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 the wine or the juice, and partaking of the, the, the bread, that you earn some kind of special merit, or it nourishes you spiritually. None of, that is, none of that is true. Now, again, this is an infiltration of bad thinking, right? The thinking that an external thing can actually do something within you, it's, it's not biblical. So why do we take communion? Well, one, for Jesus said that. Secondly, when you take communion, you know what's happening? You have faith in what God has said. And by exercising faith in what Jesus said to do, you come to him, you remember his death and resurrection, and you do it in, remember, in remembrance of him, looking forward to the coming of Christ, it says Paul. And when you exercise faith, God has grace for us. The, it's the faith of the believer in the Lord's table that access grace in our lives. Not because you took something in you, but because you exercise faith in what Jesus has said, and then there's that relationship with God that is internal, and God gives grace to the believer who, by obedience, is just simply following Scripture, right? But that's, 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 that's just one example. Now, legalism, on the other hand, forces you to do things external in order to merit something. And what does it say here? It is good for the heart to be strengthened by outward things? No, by grace. Where's the grace? Within you, as the Spirit of God works within you, as the work of Christ works within you, the gospel works within you, there'll be more faith. There'll be a real love for Christ. There'll be real grasp for truth. There'll be real holiness, personal holiness, the, and, and the resistance of temptation. That's going to come. That is why we need grace, and none of that is external. Everything is from within, right? More holiness, resistance to temptations, a deeper spirituality with Christ, all from within. Now, we have to live out our faith, yes, and it has to flow out of us, yes, but it flows from a relationship with Christ. It flows from the innermost parts of our being. It is good that the heart will be strengthened by grace. Now, it took too long for that, so we got to hurry. Verse 10. Now he gets into, I think he's talking about the Day of Atonement. Now, he doesn't mention the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, but I think it's pretty clear. It says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burnt outside the camp. Therefore also that uh, also Jesus, that he might sanctify the people through his blood, suffered outside the gate. 
Now, I emphasize the point here. The Day of Atonement, a lot of sacrifice, but this is their high holy day. An animal was sacrificed, right? And it was burnt outside the city. They had to take the, the remains of that animal and take it outside the city. Or the animal itself was taken outside the city. And then the blood was brought into the holy place to sanctify, to cleanse everyone in the holy place, the priests, and it was for purification, right? But it was the blood that was for purification, not the flesh. They didn't eat it. They did not eat it. It was simply the blood, teaching us that purification only comes through blood, right? And so everything that the sin offering talks about, any animal, it was about Christ. It was about his death, his, his body, and his atonement, his blood that accomplishes this. So nothing external. It was all internal, but there was, there was to de- demonstrate to the Jews by the animal sacrifices that Christ was going to come, that, that, that salvation came through blood, not by eating or consuming anything. Paul said this true in the book of Romans, chapter 14. He says, you know what the kingdom of God is about? He says, it's not about food or drink. He said it's about righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is about. And that comes from within. So Christianity is a, by far a very internal relationship with God that has nothing to do with external things to get grace from those things, but has to do with the inward relationship that you and I, that you and I have with Jesus Christ. Now he says, we don't have an altar. We don't have an altar. We don't. There's no altar here. You won't find an altar in this church. Um, what we do have, what we do have is a place where the sacrifice was made. In the New Testament, there's one place that goes back to over and over again in the Gospels and in the letters of Paul that we always have to look back to. The place where the sacrifice, the sacrifice was made. Anybody know where that is? Standing behind me. Right? It's the cross. The cross becomes our altar. The cross becomes the place where our Lord was crucified. And therefore, countless times, the New Testament encourages us to pick up our own cross and follow Jesus, to deny ourselves and follow him. That's the cross. That's, that's our altar. Now, there is no blood uh, uh, sacrifice that we give because we have Christ, right? Sin offering was Christ. Now, it says here in verse 12, he suffered he suffered outside the gate. He suffered outside the gate. And this is true. I was in Jerusalem not too long ago. And there's the old city, and you could see, and they tell you this is where Christ walked, and he walked right outside the gate. And it's absolutely true. Jesus was crucified on a hill called Calvary, Golgotha. Now, there's uh, discussions of where that really happened. You know, was it in this here, in this mountain? Was it the Holy, Holy Sepulchral Church or the other place where they think? So we don't know exactly, exactly where it was. Uh, but we know it was outside the city. That's absolutely undeniable. So when Jesus was taken out, he was taken out of Jerusalem, out of the city. Now, why did they take Jesus out of the city? Anybody know? Well, it was God's will, right, that he'd be crucified there. It's interesting, isn't it, that they didn't kill him right there. He didn't kill him right in the city. They didn't kill him where the animals were killed. Um, were the altars, the altar of sacrifice, the altar of sin, all those things were not, he, what, he didn't die there. He had to be taken outside the city as to say the cleansing of sin is not going to be found within the context of Levitical sacrificial system. Jesus had to die outside of it. Because the person who now says, hey, I need to come back to this because that's where our Lord was crucified then they'll be very confusing because that's where animals were crucified too. No, we say we come to the place outside the camp where our Lord, who's outside the Levitical sacrificial system, was crucified. The sacrificial system was inside the city. Christ was crucified outside the city. As it were, you need to find cleansing, not in here, but out there. Where do you find cleansing for your conscience and sin is at the cross. Where was Jesus taken? He was taken outside the camp. He was removed from the sacrificial system of the Levites. Why? Because he was rejected by the priest. He was taken out by the religious leaders. In fact, they say, get, you know, take this man out, get away from this man. They wanted nothing to do with him. 
You know, they said he was new wineskin, we're old wineskin, and this is the way it was going to be. And Jesus went outside the city. So the believer now, it says, therefore also Jesus, that he might sanctify the people through his blood. Again, the atonement, right? It wasn't the animal flesh. It was his blood. It was the blood of the animal. So it's pointing to Christ. It is the blood of Christ who's going to sanctify you. Not some external thing. You're not going to be set apart by what you eat or what you don't eat or external things. You're going to be set apart by, well, that's what the word sanctify means, through Christ's blood, relationship with him. He suffered outside the gate, verse 13. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Well, this is a challenge, isn't it? What's the challenge? It says, let us go. That's another way of the writer of Hebrews encouraging us to do something about it, right? Let us go forth outside the camp to him. Why? So we can bear his reproach. Our Lord did it outside the camp, no doubt. He came out of the Levitical system. And so the believers at this time were told to not to go into the old covenant theology or or the old covenant ideas, but go into the new covenant where Christ is our high priest and he's our sacrifice as well. He was rejected. And therefore, if you're going to come out and follow Christ, guess what's going to happen to you? You will also be rejected. This is a challenge. And it's heavy, isn't it, sometimes to hear this? But it's biblical truth that as we get closer to Christ, there will be that reproach. We will be approaching a camp of reproach. It was asked of Spurgeon by a young lady, Charles Spurgeon, wonderful preacher. Christian lady walked up to him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I just became a Christian. How much of the world do I have to give up? Spurgeon said, that's easy, dear. The world will give you up. Don't worry about it. The world will give you up. It's true. This has been true of many Christians throughout history. The closer we've come to Christ, the less and less the world wants to do with us. Those in the early church lost their family, lost their jobs. They were rejected. They were outcasts because they stood with Jesus. And that's the encouragement to the writer, to the, to the Hebrews here. Come out and join Christ. Yes, there will be reproach. Yes, there will be suffering. Yes, there will be that rejection. And yes, you will suffer a great deal of loss but you will inherit a great deal. By the way, you're going to lose it anyway. So whatever you lost because of Christ is a gain because you're going to lose it anyway. When we die, you can't take it with you. So why not lose it early? Why not lose it early? Less baggage, right? All kidding aside, this has been true of many Christians. They stood with Jesus and they were ill-treated. And some of us will have to make a clean break at one point in our lives from our current social scene and, in, and embrace the calling of Christ in our lives despite the cost, despite the ill treatment, despite the fact that many of us may be reluctant to do that. We know we ought to, but we don't. It will be like that, and it will be like that in the last days too. In the last days, we're going to see more Christians become reproached and outcast and ostracized, humiliated. Why? Because we're we're bearing the one who went outside the camp. Look how they treated him. Remember, Jesus was thrown out. Prepare to deal with that. If you really want to follow Christ, that's going to be the challenge. By the way, Christians have done this throughout history. Right? More and more. Verse 14. But there's something about this that the, the writer of Hebrews encourages. It says, for here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. Whatever persecution you suffer, whatever you bear, whatever reproach you suffer, uh, it will be a very short time, and it will be very short-lived compared to the amount of time that you will be spending in the new Jerusalem, contending to the new city that God has prepared for those who follow him. The writer of Hebrews is saying in a prophetic way, right, don't put your hope in this city. Put your hope in the new Jerusalem to come. Now, what do I say that prophetically? Not long after that, perhaps even 10 years after that, depending on when the writer of Hebrews wrote the letter to the Hebrews, uh, the Romans came in, 70 AD, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, leveled the place, and there was no longer, ever since then, true in history, never since then there's been a Levitical sacrificial system in this world pointing to the fact that Jesus, that the way a Jew would be converted 
It's the only way. It's going to have one blood atonement. And you need blood atonement in order to be cleansed and forgiveness, right? They don't have a day of atonement anymore. They don't have a Yom Kippur because they don't have a temple. They don't have sacrifices. It left them with one decision. I guess two. Reject Christ or follow him as your only blood atonement. And for centuries, Jews have made the decision. Unfortunately, many of them have rejected him. They even invented a whole new religion called Talmudic Judaism that has no sacrifices, nothing to do with Moses or the Old Covenant. Or they have accepted Christ like Paul the Apostle and many others who follow Jesus. And being in Jerusalem, got to see so many young believers, so many young Christians who love Jesus are Jews and they love the Lord. Right? Uh, it's an ever-growing number and God has his people there. But Second, Te- Second Temple Judaism was destroyed completely. 780s. Imagine if your hope was in that city. If your hope was in those sacrificial systems that are going to be wiped out, your faith would have been destroyed. Because if my hope was in that, that man can come in and take it away, you would have been like, what do I do now? But we have a magnificent city, says the writer of Hebrews, a city which is to come. Always weigh your circumstances to what is to come. Always weigh them out. All right, Christians, we all suffer from difficulties, right? Anybody here? Trials, tribulations, hardships. How many hands do I have? How many feet can I raise, right? Um, Always weigh them out with the glory which is to come, Paul says. Always weigh them out. Why? Because when we look at the problems and difficulties, we go, man, how am I ever going to get out of this? And the answer is, you will soon. When? Soon. When is that? Soon. I don't know. No man knows the day or the hour, but I don't know when you're going to die either. So, I mean, not being, you know, morbid or anything like that, but just that's a reality. I don't know when that's going to happen, but you will have it soon. Oh, it's so hard. It's so difficult. Yes, but you know, it's going to be a very short time. Even if it lasts 80 years of trials, you have an eternity of glory. Which one do you want? You want an eternity of glory and 80 years of suffering? You can deal with that, can't you? The blessing is we haven't had 80 years of suffering in this world. God has been so good to us. We've actually haven't had any in terms of, in, in, in terms of what other Christians go through, this is paradise in comparison to what other Christians go through. So could you give up a little bit of the comfort and a little bit of the circumstances that you face and say, I'm willing to re- be reproached because of Christ because I'm going to inherit an eternal weight of glory. In fact, Paul says, if we suffer with them, we would also reign with them. But if we deny him, he says, he would also deny us. That balance of Scripture is always, it was beautiful, isn't it? The balance of Scripture. On the one, he says, man, if you live for Christ, even through suffering, you will reign with them. Anybody goes, hey, hallelujah, praise God, right? We're going to inherit a kingdom. But then he says, if you deny him, if you deny him, he will also deny you. Oh, that means I have to keep living for him, despite the reproach and the rejection. Yeah. Think of Christians in Vietnam and China, Pakistan, India, all, I mean, we got a whole wall that tells you all about them right there, right over George's head. All about what Christians go through. Find out about them and find out what they're going through. But we have a city greater than even the old city of Jerusalem. That is the new Jerusalem that's to come. Now, let's, let's finish off. Because if Christians don't have sacrifices, right? Old Testament sacrifices. Do Christians have sacrifices? And the answer is yes, surprisingly. We just don't have blood sacrifices. Verse 15, through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. It's not with our hands. It says, the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. You know, Christians are to make sacrifices, but not at the, you know, in the Old Testament, there was at at the evening and morning sacrifices. There were sacrifices of different types of the day. The sacrifices of a Christian is continually, often, consistently, doing it always, rites and ceremonies, no. Christ, as an offering to God, he is our perfect sacrifice, and we continually give thanks, a sacrifice of praise, praising God, giving him thanks. You did that this morning. You sang songs. You did sing, did you? Hopefully you did. Even if you didn't know the song, you learned it. When I was a young Christian, and maybe we, no, we're not going to do it here, unless Somebody wants to do it. When I was a young Christian, they, they made me do this. They took the, 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 the words out of our hymn book, and they told us, learn it. Because we were getting real comfortable by, oh, I'll just, I'll just read it. 
So everybody had their hymn book or their sheets. We didn't have hymn books, but sheets. And so we depended on the sheets. And then they said, okay, you've sang long enough. Take your sheets off. Now you got to sing from the heart. And everybody's like, what? <laughs> but you know what? It made me remember them all the songs. I still, I still, no, well, yeah, that was good too. Um, I still remember many of the songs. And when Christian sometimes plays one of these older songs, I, I just close my eyes because I remember them. They're internalized, right? Internalize these things, right? Um, I may be sitting in a jail cell one day, and I'm, I'm not going to have one of these. So how am I going to sing? <laughs> it's got to be in here, right? Start there. Giving thanks to God. Why? Because he is our sacrifice for sin, never to be repeated. And we're cleansed, not only sin, but our conscience. What other sacrifice should we give? Verse 16. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Don't forget the other sacrifice. There's a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. What about the sacrifice of giving of yourself to others? That amazing thing, isn't it? Meeting the needs of others. Ooh, right? That's a challenge, isn't it? Well, it's not a challenge on the holidays, isn't it? Because we're all reminded of that and we all feel good about it and we're going to share something. But what about uh, on February 7th? Well, what's February 7th? Nothing really, just a day. Would you be doing the same thing that you would do now? Um, don't fall into the trap of being calendar Christians. You know what a calendar Christian is? Calendar Christian is they behave according to the calendar. It's Christmas. Everybody's nice. We sing songs. We go to church, that kind of stuff, right? Um, but February 7th, what's, it's just a regular day. As a Christian, we live the same way, the same, day, the same way. Every day is the same. Why? Because every day belongs to Christ. Every day is his. So I should be the same. I, there shouldn't be any furthermore activity. I should share the gospel on those days. I should share uh, things on those days, right? Because... I should give a, a, a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, let's finish. What's the main point? We've got a couple of things. Main point. There we go. What's the main point, right? Is Christianity, and I'm going to ask you a question. This is your participation. Is Christianity a bunch of external rites and ceremonial rituals? No. It's what's going on within the person. It's, it starts in, call it the heart, call it the will, call it the innermost being, and your relationship with Christ. The scripture says the Holy Spirit dwells with your spirit inside of you. There's a dwelling and fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit inside. And that is the internal relationship we have with God. We have access to the Father because of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It's internal. Now, things flow out. Don't get me wrong. Things flow out of that relationship. But don't do it the other way. Don't say I need the external in order to change within. It never works. I need the inside, the internal, the right relationship, the Spirit of God to now flow out of my life in order to do those things. I need grace. I need the grace of God. Does Christianity have an altar in a sacrificial system? Trick question, isn't it? Yeah. No in a sense of blood atonement or blood sacrifice. Yes in a sense of our only sacrifice is Christ. We have the cross. And our sacrificial system is not something that we do external, but something that comes from within something that comes from within, the sacrifice of praise. What about what Paul the Apostle said, to bring our bodies a living sacrifice, right? doesn't mean you put yourself on the altar and light yourself on fire. It means you deny yourself and you put yourself at God's disposal by not being conformed to this world in our thinking, but to, re to be renewed in our minds through, uh, through the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit. So what do we do? What do we do as, as Christians we have to make sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices? Praise, thanksgiving. You do it with our lips more than we do it with our hands. And what else? And we share with others, right? The kindness to others. If anything, right, that gives attention to those things, if I should say it this way, if we have external things that give attention, that, that is Christianity, uh, that, is not, that is not biblical. It has to be something within. It's not the external things that demonstrate Christianity, but true Christianity is grace. It's kindness. It's in the heart of the believer, right? Um, and it's important for us to have that main point. It's a very, very critical point. Um, 
that we need to make is true Christianity is the kindness and the grace of God within the person through the, through the new birth. And it's the heart of the believer that's changed first. The Spirit of God working in the believer, changing them, and that we are relying on the, on the work of Jesus. That's really where Christians need to rely on. And, and then we bear the reproach. Once we come to Christ, we bear the reproach of Christ, um, longing for heaven, longing for the new city. And it, this, uh, this has to be, again, reiterated to Christians, that it has to be from within. Now, let's finish this because now the writer of Hebrews says, let's finish. Here's an exhortation. Pray for us, he says. We are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you the more to do this so that I may be restored to you sooner. The exhortation is something to do. That's what the word exhortation means, an encouragement to do something. And in verse 18, and this is kind of interesting, for the first time in the whole letter to the book of Hebrews, he mentions himself. He has never mentioned anything of himself uh, before that. He finally does, and he says, not even him, he says, pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us because he has written a, a very pointed letter. And no doubt the book of Hebrews is a, or the letter of Hebrews is a very strong letter at times, of great encouragement at other times, but some people may take it as very strong. And he says in verse 18 that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably. He confesses he needs them to pray for him. That's humility, isn't it? When you got this great apostle, whoever he was, writing this, and he says, in good conscience, I've done the right thing. I've written a letter. And um, I want you to pray. Pray for us. That what? Verse 19. That, that all the more, I urge you all the more to do this so that I may be restored to you sooner. Great humility there. Asking for prayer. But prayer for what? Prayer that he may come to see them. That is somebody with courage, by the way, because you write a letter. It's easier to write a letter, isn't it? And just say, oh, here's a letter. Or you send a text. We don't write letters anymore, right? But maybe you do. You write a letter, you send a text, you send an encouraging message or maybe a strong message to somebody. Say, hey, man, get things right. And we leave it at that sometimes because we don't want to face the person. But here the writer of Hebrews says, I want to come to you. Not only did I write it, I am ready to face you face-to-face. -face. I'm ready to talk to you and go over these things because certainly they would have some questions. And he's straightforward. He says, look, the reaction may be strong, but I'm ready to meet with you. It's a great lesson in prayer, by the way, those two verses, how to handle something that you may be uncomfortable. First pray. If you can meet them face-to-face, -face, write a letter. Send them something. But then be willing to meet if, so, if they chose, so, so choose to, right? Sometimes they may not want to meet, but here the writer is willing. Now, more exhortation. Look at verse 22. But I urge you, brethren, again, another exhortation. You've got to do this. Bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. He claims to have written it briefly. Now, there's 13 chapters, and if by all means, you would say, well, it's taken you almost a whole year to do this letter, and you would be right. End of January 2022, early December 2022. Still took us about 11 months or so to get through this letter. And, um, but what he's saying briefly is the fact that so many things are in this letter, and he wrote it in 13 chapters. It's amazing to me. How did he do that? Because it's taken me a whole year to kind of explain it all, right? And yet he was able to concise Put the thing in 13, you know, 13 chapters or so. There was no chapters by the you know, just a letter. Uh, but it says, you know, all these truths are packed in there. It says, bear with it. He says, bear with it. Uh, for I have written to you briefly, take notice that our brother Timothy has been released. Bear with the word of exhortation, right? And it says, now another exhortation. Remember Timothy. Timothy has been released. Apparently, Timothy was in prison. I don't know if you knew that. He followed the steps of Paul. Paul says, don't be ashamed of me, of my chains and of, of, of a Christ prisoner. Apparently, Timothy got in trouble, just like Paul, by preaching the gospel and going to, to, the, to, the, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Now, why, do, why are we told that Timothy is in prison? Anybody have any idea? Sort of like, oh, by the way. <laughs> Great point, Scott. I didn't write that down, but that should be put in, put it in there. Yeah. Um, 
Timothy has been released. I, I, think, I didn't think what Scott said, but I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, I think what he's trying to say is, for exhor- exhortation to the body, is don't forget about other believers that you may not be thinking about them all the time. Don't forget about them. Because as Christians, especially in American, to my shame, American Christians, we're very tunnel vision. We're tunnel vision. We're very uh, funneled into our own silos, meaning that, you know, we got my ministry. That's what I do. And outside of that, I may meet you on Sunday or Wednesday, but that's about it. And we tend to just so be so tunnel vision that the ministry of the Lord becomes in my head, in mine, maybe your head too, and might become in our head, our ministry. You know what I'm saying? It beca- I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, where it becomes my ministry now. It's not the ministry of the Lord. It's what God told me to do. And it emphasized the me, right? And we forget other Christians. Here the writer of Hebrews says, don't just be interested in your own work. That's important. But be interested in other believers and what they're going through and their plight and their difficulties. Why? There are many Christians suffering. And don't be just a Christian that says, you know, I go to church on Sunday, I help out the church and stuff like that, but I don't want to know anything else. No, find out more about what other Christians are going through. This is what was so encouraging to go see other believers in Israel. Years ago, I went to other, uh, in Asia, other believers in Mexico. Hopefully, we get to go other places, and maybe by God's grace, you can come along and, and, and minister to them as well. But it's important to know. And if you can't get there, read newsletters about what they're doing. What, I mean, the Voice of the Martyrs has plenty of good letters. Barnabas Aid has good letters. Uh, Moral Ministry has great newsletters of Christians around the world that tell you what they're going through. Get involved. You know what happens to your prayer life? It changes. Because it's not, Lord, bless me. Thank you, Lord. Good night. You know, that kind of prayer. But it's, Lord, be with this brother. He hasn't seen his family in 10 months. I don't know what would I do if I didn't see my family in 10 months. And yet he's praising you in prison. He's thanking you. I and mean, we have nothing to thank for at that moment in time if I was him, but he's praising you. Lord, please either release him or give him more grace. Right? Your prayer life changes. Your prayer life really changes. And that's why I think the writer of Hebrews includes that. Verse 20, uh, 24. Greet all the leaders and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Oh, man. He says we need grace, and he finishes with grace. He says grace to all. We need more Jesus and more of his grace, absolutely. Spiritual strength in the heart. That's what we need the most, not external things, his grace. How do we access this grace? Through faith. So they a deeper relationship with Christ. And we need to pray for grace for one another, which is an important thing, important thing to, to have. Is, and by the way, there, there might have been some Italian believers that were next to this brother, or he wrote it from Italy. There are some people who believe that he wrote Hebrews from Italy. It would have been an interesting thought, right? Italian believers. We have some Italian believers here, right? Yeah. Yes, amen. All right. Uh, or they were with them when he wrote this letter. But there were some believers there. Eventually, we do have a letter to Italian believers. That's the book of Romans. Grace to be you all. Now, I left this for the end because of this reason. He leaves us with a benediction. And I'm telling you, what a wonderful benediction. This is one of the best ones in the New Testament. Verse 20 and 21. Now the God of peace. Now benediction, by the way, it's the exaltation of Christ or the worship, final words to exalt Christ or worship God. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What a wonderful benediction. We have to memorize this. Why? Because he reminds us a few things. We have the God of peace. We have the God of peace. And the God of peace can only be sought or can only be had through Jesus Christ. It's all about what God's done for us, by the way. When you read it, it's all about what God has done. What has God done? Well, this great God of peace brought from the dead Jesus Christ. He brought from the dead Jesus Christ the resurrection. He is not only a, it's not only a private resurrection. Look what it says. He is the great shepherd of the sheep. 
He's the great shepherd of the sheep. That means that whatever happened to Jesus is going to happen to his sheep. That's called the resurrection. The shepherd of his people. The shepherd had a resurrection. You are going to have a resurrection. Despite the difficulties, there will be a resurrection. And because there was a resurrection, that means there was a death. It says here that through his death, through the blood of the eternal covenant. Oh, that's amazing. The blood of the eternal covenant. Talking about the new covenant. The new covenant, which is in Christ's blood, is the eternal one. It encompasses all eternity. That means that the old covenant was fulfilled. This new covenant is eternal. It'll go on forever. If you trust it in Christ, your salvation is in the eternal covenant that God made through Christ. His blood is eternal. Notice that eternal covenant that he made. It's everlasting at the cross, the fulfillment of the new covenant, which he established at the, at the supper, which he said, this is my blood, this is my body, Right? And has been fulfilled, and it's everlasting. And it says, this God is going to equip you. Verse 21, and every good thing to do his will. Oh, that's so nice, isn't it, to know that God is going to do this? I'm never concerned about what God's going to do, but whatever he promised, he will do. So you can take this better than any other promise, right? My concern is always me. I'm just not so good at following through with what God told me to do. And it says, he'll make you complete for every good work. Complete for every good will, for his will, working in that which is pleasing in his sight. He wants the Christian to be complete. The word complete there is to be almost, the the idea is the word perfect. Not perfected like no sin, but there's be a completion in our lives of our weak points. If you have weaknesses, to be stronger. What weaknesses do you have that God needs to make strong? Right? What weaknesses do we all have that God needs to strengthen us in those things? So you can spend your life, it says, doing the will of God. You can spend your life doing the will of God. And this is the most amazing, I'm telling you, this is the most amazing benediction. I probably, it really hit me. It really touched me. And the last part is even more amazing. And this is it. To Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. All the blessings come through Jesus Christ. Whatever growth you're going to have as a Christian is going to come through Jesus Christ. No doubt, no external things. It's only your relationship with Christ. It's either Christ or nothing at all. Through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever and ever. Remember the problem with the Hebrews is that some of them were apostatizing. They were leaving Christ. If somebody's an apostate, when you hear that, you don't care. When you hear that, you don't care. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. If you're a backslider, you want to say it, but your heart won't let you say it. You want to say and you know you need to say it, but you can't, you won't. Um, because your heart doesn't want you to say it. But you know it's true. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. If you're a believer today and you hear those words, you love it. You absolutely love it. And everything inside of you says amen. To Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory forever and ever Amen. Let's pray. Father, we could say it for eternity. Through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the power and the kingdom forever and ever. Oh, Lord, our security is bound in that statement. Through Jesus, whom you sent to live a perfect life, to fulfill the law of Moses that no man in humanity will ever be able to fulfill, to fulfill the law, the weight of the heaviness of the law. He lived the perfect life. You sent Jesus to live the perfect life, to be the perfect candidate to die in our place, not only to fulfill the law, but to forgive those who broke the law that through his perfect life and perfect sacrifice and his death 
in his blood, we would have atonement and forgiveness of sin. And through the resurrection, that perfect resurrection, through the eternal spirit, he gave up his life and was brought back from the dead. Through that resurrection, we have eternal life. Forgiveness, cleansing, and eternal life. That all who would trust in him and what he did, and if they have faith and real change of heart towards sin to repent, we would have the new birth. Lord, thank you that through that eternal covenant, we have eternal life. We have resurrection power. We have the power of the resurrection in us, and we will have the resurrection afterwards to the glory of Christ forever and ever. Thank you that you are the God of peace who have given us this letter to draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray tonight, today that the things we've read, the things we contemplated throughout this whole year, reading Hebrews, taking the congregation through the entire letter, that we will sit down, Lord, and read, maybe reread it, key chapters, key verses, and we will take inventory, Lord, of what you said and things we need to certainly do and get active in doing and things that we need to come back to. Lord, help us to take inventory of those things and do what the writer of Hebrews says. Let us go on to maturity. Let us go on believing. Let us go on fellowshipping. Let us go on trusting Christ, looking unto him, the author and the finisher of our faith. So Lord, help us to go on, to go on with Christ. We heard from the writer of Hebrews, what a letter. And Lord, help us to sit down and really think through it and really think about what you said to us and really know what the next steps are in our faith and in our lives. For it's so important, it's so vital that we take your word seriously and to put it into action. Lord, for some of us, maybe to love other Christians more than we have loved them. Uh, Lord, maybe to others just to come to fellowship more and to establish roots and fellowship with other believers. Maybe to others just to come back and stop wavering and drifting, but to really settle who we're going to follow. And maybe to others, Lord God, is to remind ourselves to read your word for a sharper than any two-edged sword. And for others, maybe to come back to our great high priest who we have neglected over this time. All of it, Lord. And the summation of it all is to say, it's all about Jesus. It's really been all about Jesus on Sundays and on Mondays, and on Tuesdays, and on Thursdays, and Wednesdays, and Fridays, and Saturdays. And Lord, let us go on with Jesus. But we need your grace, Lord. We could not do it apart from your grace and spirit. Please let it overflow, Lord. Let it overflow from the innermost parts of our being, that we will stay close to Christ and close to each other. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. It's been a pleasure taking the congregation through Hebrews. And uh, I always give thanks to the Lord. We should have a party because when God gives us the grace to have go through a book of the Bible, it's amazing. You know how many people don't get to do this? Uh, and all the billions of people throughout the earth don't have Bibles. Had even heard of his first coming. We, we talk about his second coming. They haven't heard of his first coming yet, um, which we got to get going in, in that respect, letting people know about it that he's come to save sinners. It's been a pleasure. Um, next week, Sabe will be here. Don't miss it. The purpose of his coming, why Jesus came, and then we'll finish the year on that very topic. And, um, and I'm thinking next year, which is like three weeks away, something like that, yeah. Um, I want to do the book of John. I want to do the gospel of John, taking the congregation through the gospel of John, looking at it from a very Hebraic perspective, a very uh, Hebraic perspective, Christian Hebraic perspective and what John wrote, which is a very different gospel than the other three. The other three, we call them the synoptic gospels because they're side by side the same. John is a challenge, isn't it? Because he is quite different. But in that difference, 
It's some wonderful life and some wonderful verses, some wonderful things. In fact, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, if Christians need to grow, it's one book that I always recommend. You know, if you're challenging your faith, get back to Jesus. Get back to John. Read it. Live it. Do, do what Jesus said to do, and you'll find yourself closer and closer to him. So that's looking forward to next year. May God give us the grace to do that. So 